This is our second sermon in this series, Living on the Edge, Samson Style. And uh, we, I think Samson can teach us a lot. But Samson had so much potential. We talked about him a little bit last week. We're going to talk about him more this week. But he had such great potential. He was living in an opportune time spiritually where there was a void in the land. And, and the people of Israel were ready just to rise up and claim God once again. And he could have led them out of that. He was born in a godly home, raised in a godly home. God had gifted him with this supernatural strength. But he failed. And his failure can be summed up in one word, and that word is pride. And he was captured in the end by the enemy, and a mockery was made over him. J. Oswald Sanders said about Samson that he was a champion that became a clown. And the Bible says this in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And I think the lesson that we're going to learn today is a warning to anyone who might be prideful or egotistical that you cannot do it without God. And this warning of living on the edge of failure should come close to each of us as we look at our own life. And as we look, we're going to look at the chapters in Judges chapters 14 through 16 on this part of Samson's story. If you want to open your Bibles there, we're going to look at, we're going to read a lot of scripture today. Uh, the screens uh, will have the NIV, the New International Version, of the scriptures that I'll be reading on there. But feel free to open up your Bibles to Judges chapter 14. And as we look at Samson living on the edge of failure, I want you to understand that God still resists the proud and gives grace to the humble still yet today. So let's first see in this part of Samson's story that he was too arrogant to accept a Hebrew bride. He was too arrogant to marry somebody of his own nation, of his own nationality. In chapter 14 of Judges, verse 1, we read this, that Samson went down to Timnah, and he saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we learn that the scriptures taught that those who lived in the nation of Israel, they weren't to intermarry with those people of the nations around them, and there was a specific purpose. Israel was God's chosen people, and if you believed and obeyed God, He was going to reward you, and that you were not to intermarry, because eventually God was going to bring about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, into the world through that lineage but Samson lived in these progressive times in Israel. They were intermarrying with the people around them. They probably boasted, and oh, we can tolerate those people of other religions. It's not going to bother us. And they were mingling and marrying those that they weren't supposed to. Now, Samson's dad lived in the tribe of Dan. That was right on the border of the land of the Philistines. And they would go there to that border. Timnah was kind of a or the area right there by the Philistines is where the, the Israelite soldiers would go to be trained. So, so Timna was kind of a night spot for the soldiers on leave. And Samson saw this Philistine woman. Now, I remember hearing this sermon on, on uh, Samson entitled, A He-Man with a She-Problem. Because Samson liked his women. And you're going to see that today really... But Samson had an eye out for attractive women. And, uh, and you got to think the Philistines probably dressed a little more provocatively than the people of God, the Israelites. And that would naturally catch his eye. And in fairness, Samson was a target. He was a hunk of a man. Now, I don't think he was bulked up like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but he was known for his strength. And there were probably women chasing him. You know what I mean? I just read in People magazine that they have named the sexiest man alive. Did you read about that? Some guy named Brad Cooper, Bradley Cooper. Uh, I mean, he says he likes motorcycles. That's pretty cool. But he speaks fluent French, so I don't know about that. But Bradley Cooper, I mean, you know, his blue eyes and attractive smile, you know, on the big screen. I mean, what kind of woman would get excited 
about a famous, wealthy, good-looking, attractive man. I mean, I think there are some shallow women that are just attracted to good-looking, uh, famous men. Well, here's another picture I want to show you guys. There's this other guy. That went to and you know, he's like Samson. They're saying, what is the source of his strength? It's not his arm. You know, everybody, there was a news show on this morning talking about, he just keeps winning or something supernatural about it. But they were talking about these people. Uh, it's, and if you can read that, it says uh, the quarterback preacher. But there are people wearing jerseys on this news program I saw this morning that with Jesus on the back of their 15 jerseys. And they think it's a conspiracy. And they've asked him, you know, they said, what? Well, he said, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. You know, what's the sort? But, you know, people are attracted to that. I mean, I think he's single or something. Is he single? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you guys don't know that. But Samson, <laughs> Samson rejected the women of his culture. He did appeal to him to go uh, and date these Philistine women. Now, here's the point. We're not instructed in the Bible today that we're not to intermarry like back then, but we are given a clear instruction of Scripture, especially when it comes to marriage, and that is that we shouldn't marry somebody who has a different faith belief than us. In fact, 2 Corinthians says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. And if you are a Christian single particularly, you should not live on the edge and missionary date somebody who doesn't have the faith in God like you do. But you know, people marry all the time. And they don't have the same faith. And it's really not a source of difficulty. But they have kids. And then they start wanting to take their kids to church. Maybe one of them. They don't want to have nothing to do with it. Because they didn't grow up in church. And there's this constant tension. And there's people who divorce. And you know what? They divorce because they weren't even, they were not even the yoke when they got married. And they go out into the workplace. And they are attracted. This spark comes and oh... This person's for me. I got a call last week from back home. And a fella told me about the guy I walked in. He was an executive in a, in a big company. He had two company cars. The wife drove a company car. And this is what the wife heard. Honey, I need your keys. I've been fired. I need to turn in the car. Why? Well, I was having a fair work. And they're splitting up. And they're divorcing. Why? Because they're unevenly and it happens all over when you're attracted to somebody you shouldn't be attracted to. I mean, even full movie stars and, and uh, basketball players. I mean, 72 days and you can split up because that's what happens when you're unevenly yoked. Listen to this verse of Scripture. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. You know what? It gets so complicated when you're unevenly yoked. And, Sarah, and Samson was too arrogant to listen to God when it came to this point. You need to marry somebody of like faith. Well, the second thing I want you to see about Samson here is he was too egotistical to listen to his parents' advice. Verse 3 reads, His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Phil Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She is the right one for me. And Samson just outright said, I'm not listening to you, Mom. I'm not listening to you, Dad. I understand there are three phases of a child's life. First, there's the dependence, then independence, and then there's this interdependence. So when a child is young, there's this total dependence upon his parents. And then when a child is in the teenage years, there's this total independence. And then after they get older and they wise up, they go, I need my family. I love my family. I love to talk to my family. In fact, somebody wrote a child ages two to five believes dad knows everything. Ages six to nine, dad knows most things. Ten to twelve, dad knows some things. 13 to 19, dad knows nothing. 20 to 29, dad knows some things. 30 to 39, dad knows most things. 40 to 50, better check with dad. And 50 and above. Well, you know, dad used to say, and Samson thought he knew better than his parents. I mean, what did these old people know about attractiveness and dating? 
So he insisted on going and seeing this Philistine girl. And he, he threw this big wedding party. We talked about that last week. There was a big debacle there. And, and uh, it was disastrous. And what did he do the, in verse 19 of chapter 14? It says he went home to his father's house. You know, what do kids do after they get burned? They end up back at the parents' house. Because he's accepted there. He's loved there. He finds security there, a source of comfort. But eventually he goes back to get his wife. And what he does, his father-in-law had given his wife to his best man. And then the father-in-law says, why don't you marry that younger know, sister? She's more attractive anyway. And this just burns the Samson. I mean, all of that hurt and humiliation could have been avoided if what? And if he just listened to his parents and God's advice. Proverbs 15 says, A fool spurns his father's discipline, but whoever needs correction shows prudence. And it's true. I remember years ago, a group of teenagers taking their parents' car by permission. But they didn't listen to their parents' curfew. And they left the party way late. And on the way home, they crashed. And they were all killed. I mean, that is parents' worst nightmare. Why didn't the kids listen to their parents? But they didn't. And the point is, teenagers or young people, you listen to the advice of your parents, even if it sounds old-fashioned or silly, or you question that. Deuteronomy says, honor your father and mother, and you're going to save yourself a world of hurt, maybe even your own life, if you heed their instructions. Respect them enough to listen to what they say. And remember, they were kids before too. They've been through it before too. Understand, they've got a little wisdom too. But Samson rejected his parents' advice. Thirdly, Samson was too conceited to allow for God's justice. When Samson realized that his wife had been given to his best friend, I mean... All he could think about was this revenge. Look over to chapter 15, starting with verse 3 there. It says that Samson said to them, This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them now. And he was going to do that too. I mean, he should have had repentance on his mind. He should have thought, oh, okay, well, you know what? Some of this bad stuff's happened. Maybe it's because I've not listened to my parents. Maybe it's because I've not listened to God. I mean, I took this Nazarite vow and I'm going against it all of my life. Please forgive me, God. But he didn't. He was just bent on revenge and getting this satisfaction. I mean, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, whoever seeks revenge should first dig two graves because if you're setting out to kill somebody, you're probably going to kill yourself in the process. The Bible does say, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. But verse 4 goes on to say that, that he went out and caught 300 foxes, tied them tail to tail in pairs, that he fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and the olive groves. I mean, doesn't that sound like a teenage prank? And, and the Philistines hear about this and they say, who did this? And they set out to to, to get Samson. And uh, they went up, actually, and burned the house of his new wife and father and burned them in it. And verse 7 goes on to say, Samson said to them, Since you've acted like this, I'm not going to stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock in Etham. Now, a humble faith even when it's humiliated, will wait on the justice of God. There's no vigilante justice in God's plan. I mean, Romans 12, 19 says, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. But a wounded ego says what? I don't get mad, I get even. And that's what Samson said. He was, he was totally out of control. Proverbs 29 says, A fool... A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. But Samson is out of control, and he goes against his vow and touches something dead again. He picks up a jawbone of a donkey, 
and he kills a thousand Philistines. And in verse 16 of chapter 15, we read this. I want to kind of read it how it was written in the Hebrew. Then Samson said, With the donkey's jawbone I've made donkeys of them. With the donkey's jawbone I've killed a thousand men. That's kind of how it goes in the Hebrew. So he's proud, but he's a poet. He's kind of a wise guy. But he's exhausted. And he's wiped out and he loses his strength. Verse 18. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? This is the only time, I think, when we read about this 20-year history of Samson, that he gives God the credit for anything. And he's thirsty. He says, Oh God, you've given me this great victory. But then when he's in need and thirst, Oh God, are you going to let me die here thirsty? Somebody said we treat God oftentimes like a policeman. When we're going 60 in a 40 mile an hour zone, we don't want to see him. But we're broke down at midnight. He's the first person we want to see. And that's how Samson treated God. God, take care of me now. I'm in need. Verse 19 says that God opened up a hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. And I think it just shows the amazing grace of God. I mean, just think about how Samson violated his oath, his vow, the commands of God repeatedly over and over. And God's great grace is so amazing. And He keeps forgiving. He keeps restoring. He keeps reviving. He keeps blessing. And He keeps giving strength. I mean, what forgiveness that God has for His children. Well, fourthly, Let's see that Samson was too proud to rely upon God for his supernatural strength. You see, I think Samson, as the story unfolds, really believed that his strength resided in, in himself. Somebody said ego stands for edging God out. And that's what Samson really had done throughout his lifetime. Chapter 16, verse 1 says, One day that Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. And what did he do? He went in to, to spend the night with her. You know, he knew. He, he didn't belong there. But he's found him another woman. Verse 2, the people of Gaza were told, Samson's here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying at dawn, we're going to kill him. But Samson wakes up in the middle of the night and probably goes, you know, what am I doing? And he goes to leave the city, and it's a walled city, and the gates are, are locked. And he, he yanks them up I mean, by their foundations, and he carries them, some speculate, 40 miles away to the top of the hill of Hebron. And they're, they're just freaked out by this. Verse 3 says that the Samson lay there only until the middle of the night, and he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts. And he tore them loose, bar and all, and he lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. And the enemy wakes up the next morning, and they're going, what? And days later, they find the gates. I mean, Samson's like the terminator of the Old Testament. I mean, they're scared of this guy. They're trying to kill him and trap him every chance that they get, but they just can't do it. And then, guess what? Samson finds another woman, and he might be familiar with his name, or Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the Valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him and is showing you the great secret of his strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. I mean, this was a huge payday for anybody. I mean, when Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery, they sold him for 20 shekels. These guys were given 1,100 each, five of them. That's the equivalent of purchasing 300 slaves, big money. So Delilah, what she do? She might have liked the guy, but she liked money too. So I mean, you might be okay if you're famous and good looking, but there's some lure about that money, and there's a lesson there, but we're not going to get into that. Verse 7 says that Samson answered, if anyone ties me with seven fresh thongs and straps of leather, 
that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. So the next time he goes and visits her, what does she do? Well, we're going to tie up Samson. They have their fun and he gets tied up and, and she says oh the, the Philistines are probably hiding in her closet. They're here. They're upon you Samson. And once he gets up and he rips those bindings and he kicks them and he kicks them out the door and throws them out the window and he just whips up on them and, and then uh, uh, they can't, uh, verse 9 goes on that he snapped the thongs easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. And uh, he whips up on these guys, and verse 10 says that Delilah said to Samson, You who made a fool of me, you lied to me. I'm so hurt. Oh, wait, well, you betrayed him, you know. Verse 11 says, If anyone ties me, you know, she's going, going back to him. What's the source of your strength? Just tell me. And he's kind of toying with her. If anybody ties me, she girl with new ropes that have never been used. I'll become as weak as any other man. She ties him up again. Oh, Samson, the Philistines are here. And he just breaks them. He pounces on those guys, kicks them out the door, throws them out the window. And, you know, they got to be kind of frustrated at this time, too. Verse 13, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric of the loom and tighten it with a pen, I'll become as weak as any other man. You know what? He's kind of flirting with disaster right here. He's getting a little closer to the source of his strength, kind of toying with that idea. She ties him up. Oh, Samson, look, the Philistines, what are they doing here? And he went, he flies, and you've probably seen pictures of that, and he kicks them out the door, throws them out the window, and uh, she goes on, verse, verse 15 of the text, it goes on as says, she said to him, how can you say that you love me when you won't confide in me? This is the third time. You've made a fool of me. And heaven told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. Now, why in the world would anybody stay in a relationship like that? This woman's out to get him. Well, when the lust is good, people do all kinds of crazy things. Steve Chapman has a book, a, a look at life, a look at life from the deer stand. And he's talking about hunting in West Virginia, and uh, he said I was in the deer stand one day, and uh, he said I hear this tromping off to the right, and here's this doe running right up into my vision, 40 yards away, and sure enough, there's this buck chasing right behind him. He said I pulled up a 30 out six and fired twice. He said. I couldn't believe it. I missed this bucket 40 yards. And he said, I was just thinking about that, thinking about it. And he, he said that the buck didn't even flinch. And he said, you know, they, they could smell good and hear good. And I fired twice, and this guy, his gait didn't even adjust. And he said, that's kind of like what it is with, it, it, there's about four weeks a year in deer season, he says, when, when, when the deer, when the buck just, they're not thinking. They're not thinking straight. They've got one thing on their mind. They're just filled with desire. And they just run after those does. And he said, I couldn't believe it. Just a couple of minutes later when I was thinking how disgusted I was without hitting the thing, I hear this tromping off the left. Here's this doe coming again. And here's that buck following right behind her. He said, I pulled up and fired twice. He said, I missed again. And that buck didn't flinch. He said, what is wrong with me? And he ends his story by saying, I think that doe knew that I was there even if the buck didn't, and she deliberately came by a second time saying, I want to give you a second chance, buddy. He said, I think I heard a female voice saying, shoot him, shoot him, please, shoot him. And he said, the bottom line is that during mating season, the buck sure makes an easy target of himself. And there are men and there are women that make an easy target of themselves when they chase after something they shouldn't be chasing and they make their health vulnerable their Christian testimony vulnerable their family vulnerable because they just throw all of their thinking out in the wind and when that something bad happens they turn around and they go what was I thinking and they weren't thinking anything except for that burning desire that they had deep down inside and Samson like many people today, was living on the edge of destruction. And I think he became, he just 
thought he was invincible. Oh, nothing's bad. Nothing bad's going to talk to me. It's going to happen to me. Verse 17 of chapter 16 goes on and says this. Uh, he told Delilah everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I've been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. I don't think Samson believed that for one minute. He just kept toying with Delilah, and then he did tell her something he shouldn't have told her. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word back to the rulers of the Philistines. She's thinking of her payday. Come back once more. He told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap. First, in, first century historian Josephus says Delilah got him drunk. Having put him to sleep on her lap. She called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair. And so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. And she called to Samson. The Philistines are upon you. The Philistines are upon you. Now here is one of the saddest verses of scripture in verse 20. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'm going to go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. God's grace is so amazing. But you know what? There comes a point when God pulls back his spirit from that person who continues to violate, to violate, to violate, and to violate till they think that they've got it all on their own. Listen to Hebrews 6. It is impossible for those who have shared in the Holy Spirit that they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their laws they are crucifying the Son of God all over again. And this man, God's man, was no longer God's man. And Samson woke up, he felt the same, he thought he was going to do the same, and he runs out there and his arms and legs are like noodles, and they overcome him, and it is brutal. Listen to verse 21. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with broad shackles. They set him grinding in the prison. Samson got in trouble with his eyes all throughout his lifetime, and then the enemy gouges his eyes out. Galatians is true. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please the sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction, and Samson reaped destruction. And there's one takeaway that I want to leave you with this morning, and that is this. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Don't ever reach a point in your life that you think, God, I don't need you. God, I'm strong, I'm talented, you gifted me, but you know what, I can do it on my own because you know what, no matter how smart, how intelligent, how gifted you are, you cannot forgive your own sin. You cannot fill the void in your life that you so desperately seek to that was put there by God. You can't gain entrance into heaven unless you humbly come before Jesus Christ because He is the only way to God. James 4 says, God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Which word describes you today? Is it proud or is it humble? I had the occasion to show you a picture here to visit the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem years ago. And they've got this church here. And uh, what's interesting about this church, you see the door, it's appropriately called the Door of Humility. You can see the lady in the, in the left lower. Uh, you've got the knee, you kind of got to get low to get through the doorway. But you see the doorway on the right, you can see the archway that's walled in now. There used to be a large archway there. That's how you entered into the church. And they said back in the Middle Ages that the knights going to fight the Crusades would ride through that archway on their horse, never dismounting to receive the blessings of the priest before they would go out on their Crusades. So they ended up walling that off because they wanted anyone who would enter there, Bethlehem, this church of the Nativity, that they would have to bow low in humility 
enter that sacred building. And it's interesting, I find, that in Scripture, that the Bible talks about Jesus being the door to eternal life. And it's so applicable because nobody is going to enter eternal life unless they bow before the Savior of the world in humility. A proud man cannot do that. Because God opposes the proud. And He gives grace to the humble. Jesus said, if you come to me, you should come as a little child. You might see Samson as a great champion. But J. Oswald Sanders said he became a clown. And God has so much potential for each one of us. For each one of you. God wants you to be a champion. But we keep clowning around in life because we're not doing life oftentimes God's ways. 100% of the time, 100% of the ways, we do not humble ourselves in humility in every compartment of our life. But God wants you to be a champion for Him. So will you rise up and say, Oh Lord, as you fall to your knees and cry out to Him, we pray for you. Father, make us champions. Why do we keep going through life, mucking it up, year after year, falling into the same patterns with the drives of our own hearts, overlapping and trotting over the desires that you have for our life? Let the story of Samson, the champion, be a lesson to us not to be a clown. That we've been fooling around for years. That we would get it right. Show us the strength that you have for us, the abilities, the giftedness that you've gifted us with. I pray, I pray that you would make us champions in our world, that we would rise up and call you holy as we bow down before you in humility. Each week we come and worship. Each day we think about you. Allow us to say, God, walk with me every step of the way, every day. That we're not clowning around in life anymore, oh God. That we can understand you've loved us so much that you gave your boy to die because you want that relationship with us for eternity. From here on out, let today be the day that we just don't sit back and hear the words that it pricks our heart, that you stir our very being. That we're not here today by mistake. We're not here in this lesson by mistake. We're not here in these words just for the hundredth time. That we're just in church. I pray, oh God, today that you would speak to me, speak to us, move us. There's so much to do. Time is so brief. Let us be totally dependent upon you today. Not independent. Not even interdependent, but dependent. As we cry out to you for mercy. If there's one here this morning, oh God, that they would repeat this with me today, oh God, oh Jesus Christ, I accept you as my Savior. Help me to live for you. If you've said that today for the very first time, meet somebody in the back after we finish praying, after we start singing, that we can leave you every step of the way. Help us to be your champions in our homes, in our lives, at our workplace, in our community, yea, even in our church.